to an earlier idea that he that he had on friendship that you shouldn't spend too much time with others because their influencing of you will not be healthy for you and you'll lose your independence we might say um, uh, we, we um, will continue now with the end uh, or with paragraph 14 and he says it this way the flower of courtesy does not very well abide handling but if we dare to open another leaf and explore what parts go to its confirmation, we shall find also an intellectual quality. Um, and then he continues, social in its nature, it respects, it, he says it this way, it entertains every natural gift. Social in its nature, it respects everything which tends to unite men. It delights in measure, now, the, this understanding of taste, as he will call it, a degree of taste. It delights in measure. The love of beauty is mainly the love of measure or proportion. The person who screams or uses the superlative degree or converses with heat puts whole drawing rooms to flight. In other words, you have to know how to behave yourself in social settings. We all, here's a 3D observation, we all know people who behave in certain kinds of social ways that gets them never invited back again, right? I see somebody smiling. We all know these kinds of people. He says, don't be that guy, right? If you wish to be loved, love measure. You must have genius or a prodigious usefulness if you will hide the want of measure. And we immediately think of somebody like Beethoven. We think of, of Thoreau in Emerson's own day. Uh, you know, these are people who defy the conventions of society, yet because they're genius, they're accepted anyway. This perception comes in to polish and perfect the parts of the social instruments. Society will pardon much to genius and special gifts, but being in its nature a convention, it loves what is conventional or what belongs to coming together. That makes the good and bad of manners, namely what helps or hinders fellowship. In other words, it's important that you understand the sociological dimension. That is to say that lower left quadrant of, Wil of Wilbur's uh, integral model, that cultural understanding. There has to be certain ways that we relate to each other, right? For fashion is not good since absolute, but relative. Not good since private, but good since entertaining company. It hates corners and sharp points of character, hates quarrelsome, egotistical, we think of Ayn Rand here, don't we, and, and Howard Rourke in, uh, in, in uh, Fountainhead, solitary and gloomy people. It hates whatever can interfere with total blending of parties, whilst it values all peculiarities as in the highest degree of refreshing, which can consist with good fellowship. In other words, there's a tension between the artist and the society at large, and we often will overlook these kinds of unbecoming elements because these are people of genius or they provide us with some kind of form of inspiration. Paragraph 15, he says it this way, accuracy is essential to beauty and quick perceptions to politeness, but not too quick perceptions. This is typical Emerson, right? One may be too punctual and too precise. In other words, don't be a, a, a prig in regards to your, your understanding of manners. He must leave the omniscience of business at the door when he comes into the palace of beauty. He continues in paragraph 16. Therefore, besides personal force and so much perception as constitutes an erring taste, society demands in its partisan class another element already intimated, which it significantly terms good nature, expressing all degrees of generosity, from the lowest willingness and faculty to oblige up to the heights of magnanimity and love. Insight we must have, what again we talk about in our Plato lectures, perspicacity, or we shall run against one another and miss the way to our food. But intellect is selfish and barren. The secret of success in society is a certain hardiness and sympathy. A man who is not happy in the company cannot find any word in his memory that will fit the occasion. In other words, there has to be a blending, a blending we might say. On the one hand, there will be this notion of me as an individual. But on the other hand, that individual has to find some way to work within the group, within society. So there's a tension at times, no question. And, uh, and in paragraph number 16, he has a great story about Fox and the notion of paying back debt that Fox is going to say to one of the debtors, I can't pay you because I have the, uh, I have to pay another because he, he's an honorable person and the person who he owed to tears up his bill and says, well then fine, I don't want you to pay me back if that's the way you think about me. And Fox immediately recognizes this, the uh, mark of honor in the, in the gentleman and says, fine, 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 I'll pay you first. In other words, the idea is that manners are a part of who you are. Paragraph 17, Europe, he says, respects 
uh, I'm sorry, everyone in Europe and Americans, ex uh, all respect cultured manners as long as they're real. Uh, again, Emerson will make fun of people who are not real. They're kind of like fakers, okay? Paragraph 18, he said this this way, real service will not lose its nobleness. All generosity is not merely French and sentimental, nor is it to be concealed that living blood and passion of kindness does at last distinguish God's gentlemen from fashions. Uh, in other words, the idea is here that we're saying even the line of heroes is not utterly extinct. There is still ever some admirable person in plain clothes, standing on the wharf who jumps in to rescue a drowning man. There is still some absurd inventor of charities, some guide and comforter of runaway slaves. This is important because it's a mention of the Underground Railroad, but it's also going to be his point that you can have manners and you can have etiquette without all of the pomp and ceremony of clothing. In other words, there's something within a certain kind of person who has good culture and good breeding, as he will say it, that uh, will be identifiable and noticeable. Paragraph number 19, he says it, he says it uh, this way. He says, because elegance comes of no breeding but of birth, there must be romance of character or the most fastidious exclusion of impertinences will not avail. It must be genius which takes that direction. It must be not courteous, but courtesy. It's a very high behavior, he says, is as rare in fiction as it is in fact. He continues, a beautiful form is better than a beautiful face. Back to that notion of those two boxes, right? A beautiful face, and then there's the form of beauty itself. He's playing a pure Plato game here, right? A beautiful behavior is better than a beautiful form. It gives a higher pleasure than statues or pictures. It's the finest of the fine arts. A man is but a little thing in the midst of the objects of nature, yet by the moral quality radiating from his countenance, he may abolish all considerations of magnitude and in his manners equal the majesty of the world. By paragraph 8, and by the way, he, he even mentions um, the, the freedom of Robin Hood um, at, in, at the end of this one. In paragraph 20, he says it this way, A certain awkward consciousness of inferiority in the men may give rise to the new chivalry in behalf of women's rights. Now this is a huge paragraph, so put this in your notes. This is one of the first moments that Emerson will come out in his essays in support of the notion of the equality for women and that feminist critique as we have spoken about it in earlier lectures. Certainly, he speaks, let her be as much better placed in the laws and in social forms as the most zealous reformer can ask, but I confide so entirely in her inspiring and musical nature that I believe only herself can show us how she shall be served. The wonderful generosity of her sentiments raises her at times into heroical and godlike regions and verifies the pictures of Minerva, Juno, or Plymina. And by the firmness with which she treads her upward path, she, con she convinces the coarsest calculators that another road exists than that which their feet know. She, he continues, We say things we never thought to have said when we are around an amazing woman. For once our walls of habitual reserve vanished and, let a, and left us at large. We were children playing with children in a wide field of flowers. Steep us, we cried, in these influences for days, for weeks, and we shall be sunny poets, and will write out in many colored words the romance that they are. He's speaking here about the power of the muses in Greek mythology, and of course the muses were women. By paragraph 21 he says, I know this Byzantian pile of chivalry or fashion which seems so fair and picturesque to those who at the contemporary facts for science or for entertainment is not equally pleasant to all spectators. He concedes a point that it's very possible that what he's been writing about is not going to be accepted by everyone. Paragraph 22, he says, But we've lingered long enough in these painted courts. The worth of the thing signified must vindicate our, test, our taste for the emblem. Everything that is called fashion and courtesy humbles itself before the cause and fountain of honor, creator of titles and dignities, namely, the heart of love. This is pure Emerson. It's always going to come back to that second box and things like love. This is the royal blood. This is the fire which in all countries and contingencies will work after its kind and conquer and expand all that approaches it. Again, the, the point he will make is all cultures have different understandings of what etiquette and fashion is. 
but all cultures respect the power of love. Right? Pure transcendental idea. This gives new meanings to every fact. This impoverishes the rich, suffering no grandeur but its own. What is rich? Are you rich enough to help anybody? To succor the unfashionable and the eccentric? Rich enough to make the Canadian in his wagon, the itinerant with his council's paper, which commands him to the charitable, and on and on he goes. In other words, are you capable of treating all people well? What is gentle, he says, but to allow it, and give their heart and yours one holiday from the national caution. Without the rich heart, wealth is an ugly beggar. Wow, what a great line. Without the rich heart, wealth is an ugly beggar. In other words, a man is rich, Thoreau will say, in proportion to the things he can live without. The generosity, in other words, of an individual is most important. Um, as we finish up, he will make this observation now. <coughs> um, he will even use in paragraph 21, the example of the king of Shiraz, um, he will provide us with a, a great example of a, of a Muslim, and an, an Islamic king, who showed tremendous generosity. I love this about Emerson, that he draws his examples from all over different cultures, and to any reader of Emerson's day or even today, they would have a bias against the Muslim. Emerson would say, shame on you. You should respect all cultures, and when you see greatness in another culture, you should speak of it as, as much. The final paragraph deserves to be read in its entirety. But I shall hear without pain that I play the courtier very ill and talk of that which I do not well understand. He's worried. He, he says, I, I know there will be people who say <clears throat> that I've reduced the importance of high fashion. And he said, I know there's people that are, that are going to be mad about that. It's easy to see what is called by distinction society and fashion. Has good laws as well as bad. Has much that's necessary and much that is absurd. Good, too good for banning and too bad for blessing. It reminds us of a tradition of the pagan mythology in every attempt to settle its character. I overheard Jove one day, said Salinas, talking of destroying the earth. He said that it failed. They were all rogues and vixens who went from bad to worse as fast as the day succeeded each other. In other words, humans are always in, in a terrible downward spiral. Minerva said she hoped not. They were only ridiculous little creatures with this odd circumstance that they had a blur or indeterminate aspect seen far or seen near. If you call them bad, they would appear so. If you call them good, they would appear so. And there was no person or action among them which would not puzzle her owl, much more all Olympus, to know whether it was fundamentally bad or good. We think of, of course, the line uh, um, from Hamlet, there's nothing good or ill, but I think he makes it so, right? In other words, how we view people will color so much the way that we actually perceive them, right? Uh, people will often respond, in other words, in the ways in which we anticipate that they will behave. Well, this is a wonderful essay. Let's finish now with some two, uh, level two and level three observations. At 2A, messages, themes, fashion varies around the world, but manners and what is constituted as good manners seem to be the same. Right or just action, if we're talking Plato and his Republic, just action, in other words, how one should all act. The, the, the law of love is always appreciated and respected in all cultures, right? Um, a second observation about, about messages or themes, there seems to be a difference between show and substance for Emerson, right? And finally, he makes the point that the rich are rich if they can take care of the poor. It's an interesting idea. Let's jump to 2B in rhetoric. <clears throat> of course, we have great stories from other cultures, as we already mentioned, right? The king of Shiraz in uh, paragraph 22. I love that he will reference a Muslim king, right, in his essay. We have allusions to Greek mythology, just like this last paragraph. What a great, what a great uh, debate between the gods about whether humans are deserving of being destroyed or not. We immediately, of course, as well, at, at 3a, think about the story of Noah in the, uh, the Judeo-Christian uh, text, right? you got to love the sometimes ironic tone of voice. What was your favorite uh, part of that in this essay? You might want to jot that down after you've actually read it. And then, of course, the argument from analogy. He loves that, and we've used that several times, um, of course, borrowing it from Plato, right, in his love of analogy. 
Let's jump to 3a and how we relate to other texts and to our world. Of course, a number, right? We, we've mentioned Plato and his four cardinal virtues and the ways in which that keeps coming back. But notice that in Plato's four cardinal virtues, right? And we've said this in other lectures, of wisdom, courage, temperance, discipline, if you will, and justice. Where is the cardinal virtue of love? You'll notice that's an important one um, for, for Emerson, right? As a, a, as a gentleman who was raised a, as a Christian and heard this term love over and over again. Uh, 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 Marx makes the fine point that um, there's always going to be these class struggles, and Emerson seems to kind of agree as well. Um, what is your favorite film about good manners and, you know, good, and, and good fashion? I remember in that film of a number of years ago, Leonardo DiCaprio's Titanic, there's a scene where the young girl is being taught how to sit at the table correctly. For those of you that know this film, you know what I'm talking about. And, um, and, and the, the heroine of the film is looking at this young girl and recognizing in the way in which she's being taught or cultured that there's a certain restraining quality that the heroine of our film is going to finally leave, break away from. At 3B, how we relate this information to ourselves, do you distinguish between fashion and manners? Right? And do you think that maybe manners are what lasts longer? Fashion kind of goes out of style. How about this one? What laws of manners do you think are outmoded? For example, some of you don't like the idea that you're not allowed to wear hats in school. And you kind of find that to be a, a kind of crazy, old-fashioned kind of manner. What about opening doors, especially for... Uh, if you're male, opening doors for a woman, or for example, if you're young, opening doors for the old and letting the old go through first, or getting up and letting the old have their seat. Do you constitute those as good manners, or do you constitute that as something that's it's come and gone? We don't need to. We don't need to do it. How about this one, where you're supposed to say yes, sir, or yes, ma'am, to someone who's older than you to show respect? How do do you think manners evolve and change, right? So. Also this question, what is one manner, that uh, form of etiquette, that you know, they tell you, used to be in, uh, you know, kind of used to be important, but isn't anymore, and you'd like to bring it back. What would that be for you if you could bring one back? What would be a manner of today that you'd get rid of if you could, because you just think it's silly? Well, there you go, an introduction to Manners, Emerson's essay. When we turn next, we'll come back to the six-paragraph essay. It's very short. His little classic called Gifts, which for some readers is one of their favorites of Emerson's essays. Thank you.